Good morning and welcome to another beautiful Sunday at Fairhaven Church in Roostown, Ohio. A couple of announcements before we get things kicked off. Don't forget that we are planning for the Thanksgiving Fellowship Dinner next Wednesday. We have eight pages today, so bear with me. Uh, please feel free to sign up for as many items as you like. I've noticed that there's uh, still some meat for next week's dinner, and Terry says we won't be eating if we don't have some food. So we'll have to go to town or something. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. I don't know either. Next Sunday. We're going to be eating all the time. Food pantry, speaking of Terry, is going good. Please continue to uh, donate items there. Uh, mac and cheese, peanut butter, jelly, spaghetti, um, things of that nature for um, families in need. Um, there's a question box there also by the door if you come in or leave, however you see it. Upcoming event tonight for the youth group is at 4.30 till 6 p.m. at Pastor Benson's house, so make sure you are there tonight. And then next week, uh, I believe is the Turkey Bowl uh, right here. Uh, from 4.30 until 6.30, so a couple hours, and then we're going to try to do some karaoke also. I remember last year you were there, right? Right. Um, okay, stay tuned for um, more youth upcoming events in December, because there's going to be quite a few um, things in that regard. And then also next Sunday, November 20th, next week, following the service, we're going to have our fellowship dinner. So, I think we've got about that already, but that's okay. Hey. Uh, looking out into December, on December 11th, men's prayer breakfast at Cracker Barrel. So, hopefully we'll see you there at 7 a.m. for about an hour or so. Sunday, December 18th, the kids' Christmas program. Uh, that'll be exciting. Uh, we have a time on that. Do you know if we have a time yet? Well, during church. That's right, that's right, you're right. And it's going to last about 20 minutes or so, I think I heard. Um, December 24th, we will have our Christmas Eve service. Uh, again, that is on a Friday, on a Saturday this year at 4 p.m. So be there for that. Um, prayer needs, as we kind of look at those that are out there. Um, Rachel Klein's father had surgery at Center of Text uh, earlier this week, and he is doing well in recovering from that also. Uh, Grace and Charlotte's friend. Um, after that wild mishap last couple weeks ago, whatever it was, how's she doing? Any update? Uh, they moved her to Cleveland, and she's not doing well. She's not doing well. Okay, so please keep her in your prayers. Um, Cleveland Clinic? I'm not sure. They just told me Cleveland, so yeah. it could be University or Cleveland Clinic. Sure. Okay. And then um, Sandy White, that's uh, Sarah Lake's mom, um, is coming home. Grandma's coming home for a little bit to hang out, huh? Good. Please keep them in your prayers also. Amber Campbell's friend, Nikki, uh, not feeling too well, so hopefully um, any update on that? Do we have enough um, She's home from the hospital. I didn't see this. Thank you. So she's home? Oh, good. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Um, and then new uh, this week, a couple of items. Um, Graham's sister, Janet, is struggling with some Alzheimer's, so please um, keep them in your prayers. And then I should have one myself if I could add. Um, one of my students is struggling with extreme depression at school. And so it's very, um, it's new to me as a new teacher. It's, it's tough to deal with and see. But um, please keep um, all of our youth in, in prayer, really, but um, especially for, for my guy who's really having a difficult time. As I look around, I'll ask to see if there's any new prayer requests anyone might have this morning. Thank you. 
thing in the hand and sort of carry them down. Thank you, Mr. Gus. We will do so. Can you want to? Yes. We have a friend, Monica. Um, she had breast cancer 22 years ago. Um, and it has returned on her spine. And then there's another spot that like, is either up or left or liver. And this is the third chemo that they're trying to push. So you mean spine?
Lord, wipe us clean. Lord, let us stand in your presence worthy because of your shed blood and because of your sacrifice. The words that we just sang, Lord, they ring true. We adore you, Father. We adore you, Jesus. We adore you, Holy Spirit. We lay our life before you, and we love you. We lift out to you all the folks that we're praying for. We give you thanks for Rachel's father. Pray that he continues to feel better. Lord, we lift up to you, Graham's sister. We lift up to you, Lacey's friend. We continue to, to pray for them, Lord God. We pray for Jamie, for all those that need you near. Let them feel your presence. And let them know that you're close. Lord, for the prayer requests that we've not spoken that are in our hearts, we lift those to you too. And pray that you take on those burdens and those anxieties. For you've promised to never leave us. You've promised to never forsake us. You've promised to uphold us with your righteous right hand. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for our congregation. We pray, Lord, that we stay focused on you and your word to fulfill your mission, the mission that you've given the church, to be a light in the darkness, to be salt in the world, to share the good news with a world that desperately needs it. Give us the strength and the understanding and the wisdom to do that. Lord, we pray for the gifts that we receive today. We pray that the gifts are given from cheerful and generous hearts, knowing that all things come from you and all things return to you. Jesus, we love you. Be with us always. We ask for this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and turn in your hymnals to page 209. 290. A couple of things. There's, um, you only sing the chorus the last time, so we'll just sing the three verses. But I just wanted to point out the last verse of the song. Um, a lot of times we sing hymns, and I think it just, you know, we just sing them. And I just really want you to look at the words of the third verse because it says, could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, when where every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above, would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole that stretched from sky to sky. That's how much God loves us. <laughs>
If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out, throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of your parts than for your whole body to go into hell. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oaths at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say this to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than they? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. Let's talk about what we just read here. Here's Jesus. He's teaching. He's teaching the Beatitude. He's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And there's a lot of stuff that he talked about here. He says, first off, the Beatitudes start off verses 1 through 12. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the merciful. Then he goes on to say that believers are supposed to be salt and light. And that was one last week where we thought, what, is, what does that mean? We, we talked about that last week. In verses 17 through 20, he tells us that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. In verses 20 and 26, he talks about murder. And he says, murder doesn't just mean when you kill someone physically. Murder means when you hate someone in your heart, you're guilty of murder. He talks about adultery. He says adultery doesn't just happen when you do something physically, but when you're, fan when you're lusting in your mind and your heart, you're committing adultery. He talks about divorce and how seriously we're supposed to take marriage. He talks about telling the truth and going the second mile. And then he ends with loving your enemies and telling them you have to be perfect. If you think about it, this is almost a, a very depressing message if you don't understand it. If you go through this whole thing and you're like, okay, um, if you hate someone, you're committing murder in the heart. I've done that. If you look at someone lustfully, you've already committed adultery. Done that. If you divorce, di divorce is a tricky one because there was a lot of things that happened back then that we don't have today, and a lot of things we have today that didn't happen back then. But the gist of the matter is, you can't treat your spouse. You can't be in a relationship with your spouse where you're not honoring each other the way God honored the church is really what it got down to. And the reality is, if we look at our marriages, we all do that at some point or other. He talks about telling the truth. He talks about going the second mile and not retaliating. I've done all these things. He says I'm supposed to love people who hate me and love people that I hate. And if I hate them, I'm murdering them. And then he says, I gotta be perfect. Well, shoot, I've already broken every one of these things. So that's telling us that Jesus, that God, means something else. Because he would never tell us to do something that we can't do. So what's he talking about here? That's what we're going to be getting to the heart of the matter. What does that mean? First, I want to start with a little story. Thinking about being perfect led me to thinking about Italians, because all things Italian are perfect. And I thought about 
Mm -hmm. You couldn't laugh, that was a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I thought about the artist Michelangelo, the Renaissance artist Michelangelo. And Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel, all of a sudden, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And um, I'll give you just a quick little Renaissance. Like what would distinguish the Italians from all of the other Renaissance people that was going on, and you can look at this in their sculptures and their painting, was the way they sculpted hands. Nobody was able to sculpt hands with precision that made them look like real life hands, but the Italians figured it out. It's pretty neat. Anyway, Michelangelo was once finishing a sculpture, and he was putting the finishing touches on the sculpture when a friend of his stopped by for a visit. Several weeks later, this friend came back, and he was surprised that Michelangelo was still working on this same sculpture. So he looks at Michelangelo and he says, you haven't been working on this one sculpture the whole time, have you? And Michelangelo said, I have. I've been retouching this little part and polishing that little part. I've been softening this feature and bringing out the features of this muscle a little bit more. I've given a little more expression to the lips and a little more energy to the arm. And this friend is listening to Michelangelo. He goes, my goodness. But all of those things that you're talking about are so insignificant they're mere trifles. And that's when Michelangelo uttered his famous quote. He said, that may be so, but trifles make perfection, and perfection is no trifle. Right? Perfection is no trifle. Or to put it into other words that we might better understand today, in the terms of youth sports, which everyone is involved with, what do you tell kids at practice? Guys, practice right because you play the same way you practice, yep. right? Trifles make perfection, and perfection is no trifle. But here's the thing. No matter how hard Michelangelo worked on his sculptures, we can be sure of one thing. None of them are absolutely perfect. None of them are absolutely perfect. Great, yes. Breathtaking, of course. But perfect, not likely. Not in a sinful and fallen world. Not in a sinful and fallen world. Jesus proclaims in the message today, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now let's consider a couple of things of what that might mean. Back in the Old Testament, in Genesis 6, 9, it was said that Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. So it says that Noah was perfect in his generation, but if you read the story of Noah, Noah certainly was not perfect. He was a, a fallen and sinful man. Paul repeats what Jesus said in Philippians 3.15. He says, let us therefore, as many be perfect, as we're perfect-minded. So one of two things is wrong here. Either these scripture passages are defying Romans 3.23 that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Or there's something about the biblical concept of perfection that we need to properly understand. And that's what we're going to talk about today, brothers and sisters. Perfection. Or better stated, Christian perfection. We need to understand what that is. And I think one of the good ways to understand Christian perfection is first to understand what Christian perfection is not. Okay? Christian perfection is not perfect knowledge. It's not perfect knowledge. God does not give to us the grace that perfects our knowledge. And as long as we're human beings, there will be a lack of perfect knowledge. We cannot have perfect knowledge of the ways of God, perfect knowledge of the things of heaven, perfect knowledge of Christ's return, can't have perfect knowledge of the events that are going to happen tomorrow. We can't even have perfect knowledge of Scripture. We can get pretty close, but we're still sinful. So we can't even have perfect knowledge of that. Lacking knowledge in these things does not cause us to break the command to be perfect because God is not expecting perfect knowledge. Secondly, per Christian perfection is not freedom from mistakes. And as long as we're human, lacking humans lacking perfect knowledge, we're going to be inclined to be mistaken regarding facts or better judgment or common sense. The most mature of Christians sometimes do things that they later regret. Misunderstanding facts and details. Even misunderstanding areas of scripture that don't relate to salvation. 
And if you don't believe me on that, I'll come talk to me. I'll tell you about Christian brothers and sisters who won't talk to each other because they don't agree on proper interpretation of the end times or whether or not you can speak in tongues today or whether or not you can't, right? So certainly, it's not perfection from freedom from mistakes. Third, it's not freedom from sickness or weakness or human frailty. Christian perfection doesn't stop us from falling asleep while we're praying or falling asleep while reading our Bible or falling asleep during the sermon. I know who does, so keep awake today. But these things aren't sin. These are, these are human weaknesses. These are human weaknesses. Certainly, Christian perfection is not freedom from temptation. If perfection would free us from temptation, then what about the fact that Jesus was tempted? Jesus was perfect in every way, and yet he was tempted. He didn't give in to that temptation because temptation is not sin until you welcome it, entertain it, and give it consent, right? So I always go back to my example of the Nutter Butters, right? I've made it up. I am not going to eat the Nutter Butter, and I know that it's sitting there. That temptation is not a sin until I go in at one in the morning and devour the whole box, right? But to understand that, I thought about it, I've entertained it, and I've given it consent. And I think a little bit about, too, we need to properly understand some Christianese. Like, one of the things that a little bit, as, as, a, as a pastor that grinds my gears, is when I hear well-meaning Christians say, God will never give you more than you can bear, which is not true. God gives you more than you can bear constantly, right? That's why we rely on him. He never gives you more than he can bear, right? Mm -hmm. What I think that is, it's a misunderstanding of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where Paul writes that there's no temptation that will be strong enough that the Holy Spirit doesn't provide a way out to avoid that temptation. So there's no temptation that you struggle with, that I struggle with, that you say, you know, the temptation, I had no way to get out of it. That is not true. Not true. On my way into the pantry to eat those cookies, I walked by a bowl of apples and a refrigerator full of carrots and all sorts of good stuff. I had all sorts of ways out, but I wasn't. I was giving in. That's the difference. And fifth, Christian perfection is not absolute perfection. Only God is capable of being absolutely perfect. Only God has perfect knowledge, no weaknesses, no infirmities. He cannot make mistakes. So his command cannot mean to be perfect like God is perfect. So what does Christian perfection mean? I read this before. <laughs> the concept of Christian perfection can really only be summed up in a deep and systematic study that can really take years to fully understand. And we don't have that kind of time today. So we're going to sum it up in something that I learned once called Donut theology, which is right up my alley. Mm. By the way, when I've done this for a glory or youth group, I did that this morning. That's why I'm holding it with a napkin now because paper's all stuck to my fingers after. <laughs> donut theology. We all know a donut. We all love donuts. Do you realize that the most popular donut in the world is a glazed donut? The most popular donut in the world is a glazed donut. Donuts originated in the 16th century in Holland. They were cooked in oil, and the Dutch called them oily cokes, which means oily cakes. The pilgrims, who had been living in Holland, brought over these oily cokes when they came to this country. And their version was a round, doughy ball that was about the size of your fist. Okay, it's about the size of your fist. Now, where did the donut hole come from? This is a fascinating story. And during the 19th century, in the 1800s, there was an old salty sailor from Rockport, Massachusetts, named Captain Hanson Gregory. Captain Hanson Gregory loved eating donuts when he was out to sea. And one day, while he was eating a donut, while he was steering the ship, a rogue wave came out and violently rocked the ship pushing him forward, and as he grabbed onto the steering wheel, he impaled one of his donuts on one of the steering things on the steering wheel. He loved how it fit on there so well 
that he told his chef from now on, all the donuts need to have a hole in them so we can stack them on a steering wheel while he's out at sea. And that is how the hole in donuts started. Right? Pretty fascinating. Now, here's the thing. When you're eating a donut, the only thing that's left, the only thing that you really cannot consume or see is the hole. And here's the connection. Christian perfection is kind of like that donut hole. It's the same as being sinless. Because the donut hole exists. It's here. You see it. But it has no substance. And it cannot be seen. Just as sinlessness as an aspect of perfection can't be seen because it cannot be achieved by us in this life. That's why Paul wrote in Colossians 2.10, so you also are perfect through your union with Christ. You see, it's not your actions or your works that paid the price for your sin and made you perfect. It is all through Christ's sacrifice, through the atonement that Christ paid on the cross once and for all. So what is the substance of biblical perfection then? What are we called to do? Well, the Greek word translated perfection there is the Greek word teleos that we see in Matthew 5. And this is a word that you all have heard. Because every year at Easter when Pastor Kelsey was alive, when it came to the final word that Jesus yelled on the cross, the final word that Jesus yelled on the cross was teleos, which means is complete or it is finished. The word teleos in Matthew 5 shows up all over the New Testament. And in many English translations, it's translated as perfect. That word comes from the word telos, which means one who has accomplished the intended goal. So if something is accomplished, if something has done what it was designed to do, it is said to be perfect. It is said to be teleos. It is said to be teleos. So another very, very appropriate translation of this word, and it is translated this way into English also, is the word mature. So teleos can be understood as perfect, as mature. It can be understood as being complete, as being whole, completeness. And that, brothers and sisters, is where Jesus is going in Matthew 5. Completeness. What we are on in our Christian life is a journey towards perfection. It is a journey towards teleos. This is what we're talking about. You see, the scriptures, the word of God, are the perfect standard for the life and faith that we have. And as we live it out on the earth, we start to display glimpses of that perfection in our lives. But as long as we're on this side of heaven, we only see it in glimpses. The notion of being perfect might be clearer if we go back to Hebrews 5, where we were about a month and a half ago. In Hebrews 5, starting in verse 12, it says this, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain it to you, because you're slow to learn. In fact, though, by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature. And the word translated mature there in Greek is teleos. Solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So in other words, brothers and sisters, to be teleos means to be mature. So for Christians, that means to be mature in the faith. So that brings us to another question. What does it mean to be mature in the faith? It's easy. It means to be responsible. It means to be reliable. It means to be dependable. In essence, it means to be a grown-up in the faith, to be an adult in the faith. It means to not be a baby. It means to be a people of integrity, to be a person who is authentic, to be a person who is faithful, to be a person who can be called the real deal. In short, brothers and sisters, we're called to not be like children receiving milk, but rather to be grown up 
to be mature, to be eating real food. And that is what Jesus is saying to us in the gospel today. Be mature in the way that you love your enemies. Be mature in the way you pray for those that you hate and that hate you so that you might be children of your Father in heaven. Do things that are hard to accomplish on your own. Today we call that adulting, right? Mm -hmm. Adulting, to be an adult, right? I had a little bit of a heartbreak Friday night. Friday night, I received back one of the worst grades I've ever received on an assignment in all of my life in school. And I mean, it hurt. <laughs> it hurt. And I called my professor, and I'm already kind of an anxious individual. And I said, Lou, I'm, I'm struggling here. And it was easy. I, I'm just, I, I'm not seeing something that he's seeing. So we just got to figure it out. But at the very end, I, I, I had a little bit, I think he could tell that I was freaking out on the phone because through all of my master's programs, I just kind of flew through, but I never had an issue in my life. And at the very end of it, he said, Vince, at the end of this, you're going to be a doctor, so it's going to be hard. So get with it. I said, okay. <laughs> but that's what it is. He was telling me, quit the pouting, get back at it, and figure it out. And that's what Christ calls us to do. Don't be a baby. Grow up. Be mature in the faith. Be mature in the faith. Jesus tells us to be perfect so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Yes, the Father has many attributes that we will never achieve. And I believe that's why in this passage, Jesus never tells us to be sinless. He never says, never sin again. He says, be perfect, be mature, be complete as your Father in heaven. The Bible teaches us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's absolutely true. We know that there are none righteous in the Bible. No, not one, the way the little kid song goes. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 40, in verse 44 of what we read, you must love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. And why should we do that? Simple. Because that's the nature of our Heavenly Father. He's saying if you're only nice to people who are nice to you, well, shoot, even bad guys do that. Even little kids know how to do that. <clears throat> but it takes maturity to rise above petty disagreements and to rise above resentments. And our Heavenly Father modeled that for us and for you when he says to love your enemies. That's why Paul wrote in verse 121, and listen closely to this, Colossians 121. Once you, and he's talking to every one of us, once you were alienated, once you were hostile in your mind against God because of your evil actions, but God reconciled you. God brought you back through his death so that you who were enemies, so that you who were hostile to God could now be presented as holy, fault, holy faultless, and blameless because of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, the Father loved us when we were his enemies. And now he's telling us that we need to learn how to love our enemies because that's a part of being mature. John goes on to write in 1 John chapter 4, and we come to know and believe that the love God has for us because God is love. And the one who remains in the love of God remains in him. And this is how we have come to know love, that he laid down our life for us and we should lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And we need to remember this always, and I brought it up a couple of weeks ago, when I say that we misunderstand the word love. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. Love is an action. You don't have to, to have feelings of love or like to love your enemies and to pray for them. That's just one of the ways that we can be mature like our Father. In Luke chapter 6, it says that we need to be merciful like our Father in heaven is merciful. In the passage we just read in Matthew and in John, it says that God is light. And Jesus taught us that we're supposed to be light. We are called to be mature to become like our Heavenly Father. And really, if you think about it, 
This idea of becoming like our Heavenly Father, it is ingrained in our very being. It's ingrained in our very being. For those of you that are parents that, that, have, had, that have little kids or have had <coughs> little kids, every one of you remember those, those first couple times. I sure do remember them that fondly, especially when I look at how big my boys are now, but when they were two, three, four, and five, how they couldn't wait to see me, see my glasses setting down on the table so they could put them on and say, Dad, look, I'm like you, right? How many days I would be shaving, putting my shave cream on, and the kids would come in and say, Dad, can you put shave cream on my face too? Dad, I'm like you, right? How many times my kids would walk up and put their feet in my shoes and come walking in with their huge shoes on and say, Dad, look, I'm like you. Brothers and sisters, that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, put on my shoes. Walk in my steps and follow me. Strive to be like me in how you love and how you serve and how you show mercy and in how you light the world. Jesus is telling us, brothers and sisters, to grow up. More specifically, he's telling us, grow up and be like me. Right when I was a kid, everyone remembers the Gatorade commercials with Michael Jordan, right? And I can still start singing the song right now. Sometimes I wish that he is me, right? Like Mike, if I could be like Mike, and he's up there slamming the ball and drinking Gatorade. <laughs> Jesus wants us to grow up and be like him, like him. A person who's truly grown up in the faith to put all of this together exhibits a mark of biblical maturity. There's many marks of biblical maturity. We develop attitudes of love, of mercy, of holiness, the desire to want to spread the good news. And I think one of the biggest marks, especially in our series on discipleship, that a mature Christian exhibits is the mark of humble servanthood. The mark of humble servanthood. A person who is truly grown up in the faith, a person who is truly mature in the faith, will abound in this mark of love. This kind of love in the Greek called agape, which means selfless, selfless giving love, will be shown in the lives of others. Brothers and sisters, the reality is, if we do not become humble servants, we cannot claim to be mature in the faith. If we don't become humble servants, we cannot claim to be mature in the faith. There's a cute illustration that I found when looking into this, and I love this illustration. It was about a second grade teacher, and the second grade teacher gave her students a lesson on magnets. Well, the next day she gave them a little quiz. And on the quiz it said, my name has six letters. The first one is M. I pick things up. What am I? And the teacher was stunned when she got the test back that almost 50% of the class answered that question with the word mother. Hmm. The word mother. Because these little kids understood what it meant to be a mom in their life. That mom was picking up after them. That mom was helping them. No doubt, dad probably would have answered the same with the same way on that question. But it's showing this maturity of picking up, of, of helping selflessly in the background. In the background. You see, little children don't fully understand being a humble servant. But that's why we teach them by example. That's why we give them chores to do. And likewise, Christians don't always understand humble servanthood. But that's why Jesus taught us. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or when Paul wrote in Philippians 2 that, G, that, the attitude, that our attitude should be the same as the attitude of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not equate, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant, becoming a human, and humbled himself to obedience by death on the cross. 
And as important as those words are, brothers and sisters, Jesus knew that doing by example was even more important than just talking. And that's why on the night when Jesus was betrayed, as Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room, before he introduced them to what we today refer to as the Lord's Supper, Jesus stepped aside and he came back carrying a bowl with a towel wrapped around his waist and he took on the lowliest of lowly jobs by washing the dirty feet of every person in that room, those whom he loved. Jesus was a servant to all and he demonstrated it and he expects us to follow him. Brothers and sisters, the more time we spend trying to be like Jesus, the more we will look like Jesus to others. The more time we spend trying to be like Jesus, the more we will look like Jesus to others. Reminds me of something my buddy Eric Hugan once told me, who, who one of my good friends who was so pivotal in my first coming to the faith. And he said, think about it this way. When you're in school, and it's time to take a study partner. If you're in a class that you're struggling, you want to get to be study partner with the person getting an A. Because your thinking will be, that person is doing well, he can help me do well, or she can help me do well, right? So imagine that life is like a class. And Jesus knows this class better than anybody else. So if you pick Jesus to be your study partner, and nobody knows it like Jesus, Imagine how much better off your life will be and how your life will look. Nobody knows us better than Jesus, brothers and sisters. Nobody. So as the more time we spend like him, the more time we spend with him, the more time we spend imitating him, the more time we spend following him, the more we will become like him. So that's the challenge as we leave here today, brothers and sisters. Let's go out there and be telling us. Let's go out there and be mature. Let's go out there and be grown up. Let's go out there and be the salt of the earth. Let's go out there and be the light in the world. And let's go out there and humbly serve. And in doing so, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words. And Lord, in these tough teachings, in these, in these teachings where we know it's difficult for us to do it on our own, we simply and humbly pray that we draw our strength from you. Lord, give us the strength we need. Give us the wisdom that we need. Give us the grace that we need. And let us truly follow your example to be close to you and to grow up and to follow you and to become perfect, to become mature, to become complete. With your help and in your name, Jesus, and we ask for this. Amen. Please stand and turn your hymnals to page 397.
us, bless us. Let us become more like you every day. And we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.